Hello, my name is Patrick Moore. And I'm Arlisa McLaughlin. And I'd like to welcome all of you to a new health show called Health Buzz. Our mission and the theme of this show are several fold, and I'd like to review a couple of our goals that Marlisa and I have discussed in terms of what we'd like to share with you. First, this is a new show, a health show, that's going to highlight current trends and scientific discoveries in the world of natural health and healing. Quite often, alternative media is not something people hear about. They know about mainstream new drugs, new breakthroughs, but they're never hearing about what are the discoveries in natural medicine. So we're going to explore that and bring it to you to benefit your health and the, the health of your loved ones. The second area we're going to look at is health span. Examine ways we can enhance your health to maximize healthy lifespan. And not just lifespan, but the quality of those years and how natural health and healing modalities can help you improve your chances of achieving this life goal. So therefore, we're going to be bringing in lots of different practitioners, farmers, people in the community that can share their wisdom and all the health modalities so that we can optimize our health in this uh, world we live in. The third area that I'm looking at is myth busting, and that's challenging the conventional wisdom of some of the nutritional advice we've been given over the last 50 years. And part of our show tonight is going to go in there and challenge the dogma of cholesterol and eggs, and we have some special guests here to help us do that. Marlisa? So taking a look at new trends in health and wellness is something we want to bring to you. We also um, would like to just take you on the ride through the fusion in our culture now of science and spirituality because the face of everything is really changing because of that. We've got a lot of science that's coming in now and backing up hypothesis or actually just take decloaking things that we thought yeah. at one time were actually fact. They're not. They could be fiction. So it's going to be interesting to see what comes down the pike and the show is kind of organic because as we progress with our show, we'll be hoping to get your ideas involved to back up our mission, to bust those, bust those myths. <laughs> Marlisa, why don't we give the audience an idea about your background and how you got involved in natural medicine and how we actually became co-host and got to know each other. Okay. So as you know, um, we met at, at a medicinal mushroom distribution organization, and um, that sparked a lot of interest in getting together for the show. Um, so for me, I guess, after I heard Patrick's background, it really provoked a lot of thought into where did I actually first get involved in, in natural healing? And I think I could just take you back to when I was seven. It, it went that far. And my mother actually had leukemia and was uh, given her last rites, and it was Christmas Eve, my dad tells the story. And no one thought she was going to make it home, but she did. And she not only made it home, but she um, she passed on January 9th. So there was a huge, there's three weeks after that. And I grew up thinking, wow, you know, she she almost didn't make it. And then she lasted three weeks after that. And it instigated the thought that mind over matter is far more powerful than just a phrase. And later on in life, then I started to... Um, think about uh, my health and when I wasn't, because I was an athlete. So after high school, when you don't have the regimen, you need to take care of yourself in some way if you're not part of a sports team or the gym wasn't even really that popular at that time. So I uh, started looking in a natural healing book for some yoga postures to help me with digestion because of all the stress of becoming a young, a young adult in the world. And from there, um, I ended up in Iceland where I raised two children, um, I married, and became part of a whole new culture. And I, I missed the yoga that I had learned here, and there was no one to study with. So everyone kept saying, well, Marlisa, you need to become a teacher so that we can have someone to teach us, because they didn't know about yoga. And there it was. I, I, they, the town actually um, sent me to America. I came back to Massachusetts at Kripalu Yoga Center, and I became certified. And I came back, and um, we started our little healing culture up in my little town. It's a coastal fishing village. So from there, I met people who were just getting involved in um, natural medicine. What were they? they were, we had mediums because the culture there is that they're a little bit different than here. So they believe in trolls. There's a lot to do with Iceland. So um, in in their culture, they believe in a lot of alternate alternative things, um, and that just kept rolling the ball along for me. 
So then the medicinal mushrooms came through, and I met you, and I've pretty much gotten involved through that. And that, that's one area as we explore natural health and healing is to look at the international implications of it because the Scandinavian cultures, maybe they live longer than us, they seem to be healthier, they have a great medical system, uh, and uh, perhaps on another show you can give us a little bit of diet advice, Icelandic Viking diet advice. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot better than you think <laughs> except for the blood pudding. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, but think. speaking of international travels, yeah. Give us some background for, for our viewers, for you, Patrick. Well, what I am now is I'm a natu naturopathic doctor and nutritionist, and I'm also a manufacturer of anti-aging skin care uh, products that I developed. Uh, but I didn't start off in natural medicine. I actually started off in the computer industry, working for IBM Corporation, Wall Street branch, New York City, sales, marketing. But uh, I grew up the son of a naval commander, and so we traveled extensively overseas uh, which had a great influence on me. I was born in American Samoa, and then we moved to Hawaii. So my initial years as a youth were Polynesian cultures, climbing coconut trees, looking at you know Polynesian foods, lifestyles, and uh, we uh, then moved to Asia, where I lived in a Chinese village in Taiwan, a couple summers in Japan. And then I think the seminal moment that I look back was I was a young boy, 11 years old, living in Saigon in the Vietnam War. My favorite story. <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> and uh, one of the few families living there. And on weekends, right outside our house, all these practitioners, herbalists, would come and put out their blankets. And I'd sit out there with them, a little 11-year-old boy, and they brought out their roots, and they brought out their little twigs and plants and herbs and animal parks. And I said, I thought it was amusing because people would line up and they'd get in line to see the, the doctor. <laughs> you know? That's so cool. And one day a man walked up and he pulled up his pants and it looked like he had a motorcycle accident. It was all ravaged around the leg, infected and you know bloody. And, and so here's, I'll never forget this because this, I've thought about it since the rest of my life. The man started to, the herbalist started to put a lot of potions together to make a salve, mm -hmm. to rub on the sore, probably antibiotic and healing ointments. And he made a tea with some potions, and that was to drink, and that was probably anti-inflammatory, antibiotic, n nature's antibiotics. Then something else happened that I remember laughing at, but now I understand it. He cut a piece of, a, of an elephant's foot off, and he made an amulet, a little charm for the man to wear, so that looking back, you know, the body-mind connection psychologically that uh, your foot is going to heal and get the strength of an elephant. That's awesome. Yeah, so uh, so I went on and, you know, through my career with IBM, you know, I was always interested in natural health, studying on the side. How can I be more competitive? How can I, you know, have more energy, more stamina? How can I get this memory going? You know, because it was a highly competitive environment. And so I read every book I could. I tried every herb, every vitamin, always experimenting. And then one day, 10 years, age 34, I said, okay, corporate life is enough. I grew up traveling. I want to go out in the world and roam around the world. So I took a one-year leave of absence, which turned into six years, and traveled and roamed the world for six years, all through Asia and Africa and the Middle East and in Paris and the Greeks and Turkey. And what did the, I did a lot of things in those six years, but one thing I did do is just observe and examine the cultural diets and the diseases of every country. And I was amazed that, you know, diabetes, cancer, heart disease don't exist in a lot of these native cultures. They're just mm. diseases of the West, but they had to deal with infectious diseases. And uh, traveling for six years, you have a lot of time to read. So I probably read every little book I could and anything like that on health. So I ended up in South Africa, and this is where my career changed. I came back to Connecticut and uh, to visit my folks. My mother got sick, broke a hip. Next thing you know, she's at Yellow Haven Hospital. Uh, health deteriorating, picking up infections, on life support, trait, all the doctors, sorry, there's nothing more we can do for your mother. We've tried everything. She's got 48 hours to live at the most. Sorry. So all this time I started observing and uh, said, geez, you know, in American medicine, they don't really try to activate the immune system and get them stronger so that they can actually fight the naturopathic, you know, mobilize your inner resources to fight off a pathogen. So I asked the doctor, I said, you know, listen, you've told me there's nothing more you can do. Can I try my stuff? And God bless them. They gave me permission. And I was influenced by Dr. Linus Pauling, a two-time Nobel Prize winner. 
and I got approval to give 500 milligrams of vitamin C every two hours or 12,000 milligrams. And I think they just were, felt sorry for me. Well, let them feel like they can help. Well, my mother started getting better. And then I added multivitamins, probiotics, omega-3 oils, enzyme therapy, all kinds of... It went up to 15 different supplements on the formulary, which I don't think has ever been done in the history of American medicine. And my mother went from two days to 12 years. And after that, and this I've done two NPR shows on this, and it's a worldwide video on YouTube, 48 Hours to Live. After that, I said, okay, my life has changed. I need to do something about this. Went back, got a master's degree in nutrition, a doctorate in natural medicine, and uh, my whole life changed just overnight from that. You know, So uh, I, I look back to that practitioner when I was 11 years old, as you, you mentioned, in Saigon, and thinking of the body-mind. And one of the things we want to do in the show is incorporate all those holistic modalities of emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, diet, supplements, exercise, lifestyle, and bring it all together and show people how they can optimize their health and their health span. And make it accessible. I mean, that's yeah. really, really yeah. important because sometimes we're just, we're, we feel really stuck in our habits and we're running around and the stress kind of entraps us so we can't find that one thing. And I find it so interesting sometimes that even the simplest tiny thing, like having a, a cup of mushroom tea or coffee instead of your regular tea or coffee, is a hard thing for people to take up now. So we hope to inspire you so that you get a tiny little seed planted in or the egg who yes. <laughs> starts to grow an idea, speaking of eggs. And speaking of eggs, we really would like to welcome our guest, Kelly. Kelly is from Stonington, and she has chickens, and we want to hear all about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's great to Welcome. have you. Well, I guess it was about uh, eight years ago. Um, I can't remember what the specific catalyst was, but I remember I started to develop an interest in where my food was coming from and started um, doing a lot of reading, and uh, through that became interested in keeping hens. And my husband had kept hens when he was younger, um, but he was mostly responsible for collecting them. So he really didn't know much about the process. So it really fell on me to research how do you keep hens and um, you know, how do you keep them through the winter without heat out in a coop and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, so that started my journey and here I am eight years later. It's been interesting and I've learned a lot. So. So do you have them, and I haven't even seen, haven't been able to go to Kelly's house to see the hen coop. Is it a large coop? Are they free range? Do we, they... we do have a large coop. We were fortunate that there was an outbuilding that we could convert. So it's really a little bit more space than they actually need, and there's a run for protection. But we do try to free range them um, for most of the day as much as possible um, so that they can get those greens and insects and just be live a happy chicken life, mm -hmm. you know. So they're, yeah, yeah. They're very, happy, that's happy, a really right? good point about free range because there are various things that we think when we're reading our egg cartons at the store. Right. And I think there's some misconception about what is a free range chicken or a cage free chicken. And in one instance, um, I came across some information that the, um, free range was that uh, defined as the chickens have the opportunity to right. leave the coop. And some of the chickens are so cramped in there and they can't even move their wings that they actually don't even know that they can leave, but the door is open. Right. So your egg box might indicate it's cage-free. So there's a lot of different uh, aspects to the chicken so, business. Yeah, they can be misleading. I mean, even vegetarian, they'll say on the box, vegetarian eggs. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing. Chickens need to eat insects and grubs and things like that. They will even occasionally eat a small frog or whatever. Chickens are not vegetarian by nature. That's right. <laughs> so, and they're actually also... Um, they're, well, they're carnivores and they mm -hmm. are cannibalistic. They are, yes. Which I didn't They'll know either. I just had no <laughs> idea. So the chicken coop, um, there are various kinds. Mm -hmm. There are actually chicken coop rentals now that I didn't know about because people are not too sure they want to have an 8 to 10 year commitment, which mm -hmm. is the lifespan of a chicken, sometimes even up to 20. Mm -hmm. And people aren't sure they can handle it. So you can actually rent a coop for a month, two months, three months. Um, and then they'll supply you with three, two or three chickens. They might give you a starter box of eggs. Wow. Um, the feed. And it comes, they pull in. They, it's on wheels. They, they set it up for you and they can leave. Did, had you know about that? I hadn't until you mentioned it to me recently. I think it's a fantastic idea. People who can't take the time or have the commitment to keep chickens on a regular basis. So they're not a, a lot of work, but they do take a commitment. Um, so it's a great option for people. 
And the nutritional value of eggs, you see a difference. So what do your eggs look like when you well, cook them? Well, you know, I'd always heard that, oh, you know, backyard eggs, farm fresh eggs are so different. And I kind of blew that off until I started raising chickens on my own and seeing that there really is a difference. I mean, the yolks are, you know, really orangey. They're not like the pale yellow, you know, that you see at a typical store-bought egg. And the whites are nice and, and firm. They're not watery. And they, it just looks like a a nicer egg. <laughs> now let's take a look at that egg. We have two eggs that we can look at. One has an orange, darker orange center, and the other one, so we can see the, um, could we see that? There you go. So, right. and the whites get watery when the egg is um, stored for an, a long period of time because there's between 7,000 7, and 14,000 pores mm -hmm. on the eggshell. So the CO2 in the egg will leave and it waters down your white. So the, and also the white will get cloudy. It will be cloudy mm -hmm. with the protein in the beginning. So that's also another way to test whether or not, or to see whether your egg is as fresh as right. you'd like it to be. So there's the two differences there with the mm -hmm. eggs. And, and you've enjoyed many fresh eggs, and I've had some of your uh, eggs. Uh, yes, it, it's great. And, you know, we get a lot of surplus We because at this point we have 11 chickens, and so sometimes we get almost a dozen a day, especially in the the height of their season. They sort of take a little break in the winter. They slow down a bit. But, um, you know, so we give off to friends and family or anybody who else who might want them. You know, I've even dropped them off down at, like, you know, homeless shelter, that sort of thing. So well, that's they never go to waste, that's for sure. That's <laughs> awesome. And, and, Patrick, people have talked about the yolk, and they've demonized the egg over t uh, recently over time. What do you think about that with nutritional value? Why are we demonizing the eggs? Well, the perception, I mean, in America is that, I'm sure you know this, yolks have cholesterol. Have you heard that before? Yes, I Be have. careful of eggs. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you think of that? It's kind of like if you mention egg, people, the next thing they'll say is cholesterol. Oh, I only have one. Or And I actually, every time I've been mentioning eggs, because I've been talking about <laughs> eggs all the time lately, <laughs> people are tired of hearing about eggs when they see me. Um, they will tell me their, their health story. The egg links directly to their fear of cholesterol and how they're trying to monitor and maintain the cholesterol with pharmaceuticals, which brings us to yeah. a whole different well, yeah, the, what, basket of eggs. The traditional American <laughs> medical advice is eggs have cholesterol, right? Cholesterol is bad. It's not a good word, right? It's mm -hmm. a bad word in the American mentality. Cholesterol contributes to heart disease. Eggs will raise your cholesterol, so maybe just eat the protein, the white, and throw out the yolk. I've seen a lot of weightlifters, athletes, and everything like that, and I have a mother-in-law who's been doing that for 30 years. No matter what I tell her, she cuts the yolk, throws it away. And uh, the yolk contains all that nasty fat and cholesterol, right? That's I mean, the that's theory. the American mentality that we've had in this country, and it's probably the last 50 years. And then a cardiologist, well, cardiologist excuse me, doctor may say, okay, have maybe one or two or three eggs a week. But be careful. Um, I'd like to go into what the science says, and I'm going to quote a few things. Harvard Heart Letter, no connection between heart disease and egg consumption. The Framingham study, the Framingham study is the most treasured study in America. It's been going on since the 1950s in terms of uh, monitoring what does or does not cause heart disease. Quote, no relationship between egg intake and coronary heart disease. And by the way, the director of the Framingham also said there's no relationship between saturated and coronary heart disease. So these are some of the mythologies that have developed in America over the last 50 years. The Columbia University College of Physicians study, men or women who ate three to four eggs per day for months had virtually no change in cholesterol levels. Even UConn here, we've done a study, three to four eggs have no relationship to cholesterol are raising cholesterol in your bloodstream. So for a lot of people, that's news, what I'm saying now. But an earthquake is going to be announced sometime this fall where actually the whole guidelines are going to change after decades of the FDA and the Department of Agriculture demonizing or, you know, cautioning against foods with cholesterol. They're going to admit that they've been wrong the whole time. There's no scientific basis for it, and there never has been. I mean, all think of our ancestors. Were they talking about cholesterol <laughs> 100 years ago, 50 years ago, thousands of years ago? No, they ate everything. They wanted the yolk more than anything else because mm -hmm. the yolk is where all the precious vitamins and nutrients are is what we're going to show. So the, the 
As reported in all the news magazines in New York Times, there's what's called the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. This meets five every five years to set the recommendations for the United States or in terms of what's a healthy diet. And they're under the auspices of the FDA and the USDA. And they're going to withdraw their long-standing guidelines that recommend avoiding high cholesterol foods. And admit they've got egg on their face, that all the science is wrong. That eating foods that contain cholesterol does not raise your blood cholesterol, does not produce an increase in cholesterol levels, and for cardiologists, does not have an effect on what's called endothelial function, an aggregate measure of cardiac rest. In essence, this is one of the most healthiest foods on earth, and it's been uh, demonized. Often when I give seminars, talk to people, go to a senior center, center uh, you know, presentation, I'll mention the word cholesterol, and people think I'm talking about Saddam Hussein, or mm -hmm. some, you know, you know, a terrorist of some kind. You know, it's like they're fearful of my cholesterol, and they're obsessed with the number. But um, I just before I go into the nutritional value, I just want to talk about a couple things about cholesterol, because I think it's the most misunderstood molecule in the history of the human race. And I, I've been teaching nurses at Yellow Haven Hospital on how to take care of themselves and nutrition for 13 years. And what surprises me is very few health professionals can really tell me what does cholesterol do in the body. They'll it's just say amazing. it's that waxy <laughs> substance and lower better and there's a good and a bad. And to me, that's a complete fairy tale. And, uh, but one thing that's so crucial to cholesterol uh, that, that helps in our body is that it's a building block of all of our hormones, all of our hormones in our body. So to make estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and everything else, we need adequate amounts of cholesterol. It's a key component of breast milk. Why would nature put it in breast milk and give it to an infant if it wasn't so crucial? It's a key component of our brain. 25% of the cholesterol body is made up of, is just found in the brain. So for, for memories, brain synapses, brain connections, and everything like that, cholesterol is crucial. It's only when cholesterol gets oxidized with bad diet inflammation that it can actually plaque the arteries, but it's really an innocent bystander. And um, Now, what can I ask you when you say bad diet? Because I can think of a few things in my diet that may be considered bad in some instances. What types of foods would oxidize the cholesterol? Well, processed foods, trans fatty acids, any type of inflammatory foods, you know, refined carbohydrates, sugars, all the, corn all syrup, the bad foods. things of that nature <laughs> uh, can inflame the, the heart. Uh, I'll show you. Maybe I could have a slide one, please. Uh, and uh, Okay, this is a slide you can't really see, but I'm just going to go show it for a moment in terms of health benefits. It's probably, eggs are probably one of the best heart-healthy foods on earth. And... Uh, Brain, great for the brain and great for the eye. And you could take that down now because I'm going to talk briefly about what's on there. And we're going to post that on the website, right? Yes, we are. Okay. You know, this, um, this uh, aspect of eggs, one thing I think you've noticed is I went out and fed my family of four for $4.50 for a dinner the other night. We all had soft boiled eggs and a big salad and everything like that. I mean, eggs from a cost standpoint, you can get 18 eggs for about $4.50. It's the best, one of the best returns on your economic value. I mean, it's remarkable. And uh, it probably is, uh, the amount of nutrients an egg has so many vitamins, antioxidants. And we talked about that yolk. Mm. That yolk is so powerful. It's almost like having a vegetable in an egg because you only find those carotenoids, they're called lutein and zeaxanthin, the fancy names, that give that uh, yolk its color. And those are usually found in collard greens, kale, spinach, pumpkins, things like that, but nature has put them right into the yolk of an egg. So it's remarkable. And those antioxidants are fantastic for your eyes, protecting your eyes from cataracts and macular degeneration. The, uh, the, protein, in, the protein and fat in eggs, if you're looking to lose weight, I mean, think about it. Ten of these eggs equals are equivalent to a bagel and cream cheese. 70 pounds. Can you imagine having 10 eggs for breakfast yeah. and not feeling bad about it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you can just keep and, popping them in. And one thing I did, you know, I always do this with the nurses at Yale. I said, you know, you have your bagels or things like donuts. I mean, you're hungry minutes later because it's sugar. Your blood sugar goes up. And you and don't feel down. well. The thing about egg because of the protein and fat, and by the way, the fat is very similar to olive oil. It's, for the most part, monounsaturated. And another fact about eggs, the yolk, has almost half the protein. Did you know that? 
Yeah, yeah. very few people realize that. 43% of the protein is actually in the, in, in the yolk. So uh, what I do with the nurses is to show you how eggs could shut your appetite down. And by the way, it was Mar Margaret Thatcher, the former prime minister of British of Great, uh, Great Britain, when she wanted to lose weight, she ate hard-boiled eggs because uh -huh. it shut her appetite down. And uh, if we can just for a moment imagine taking an egg, all of us, anybody out there looking, you've got a hard-boiled egg in your hand, and I want you to visualize taking that egg and gently eat it. I'll give you a moment to finish it, just to visualize that and consume it. Got it? Almost okay. done. Got Let's it. Let's go for the second one. Can you take it? Mm -hmm. Okay, visualize it, eating it. I'm full already, actually. Are you ready for three? No. The third. Psychologically, your brain knows, you know, subliminally, that eggs shut down appetite. They're so filling. Down. Yeah. So, um, you know, in essence, in summary, you know, they also got vitamin D, one of the few sources of this amazing hormone vitamin D that comes from the sun and is produced from the sun. So look at the yolk. It reminds me of the sunshine in many respects and a, a powerhouse of nutrients in that. So... In the interest of time, you know, I'll just summarize by saying that this myth we've had about cholesterol's bad for you, don't eat eggs or limit your eggs, is nonsense. It's poppycock. It's going to be admitted by the government shortly, and all our standards will change across America. And we'll bring the eggs back and make all the egg farmers happy. And thank you, egg farmer. Thanks for coming Very on the show. Very happy to be here. Patrick, I think we've cracked the myth of cholesterol. What do you think? Uh... Well, I think so. I mean, we're, we, uh, we demonstrated that uh, eggs are one of the greatest foods, and we don't have to, What's this for? I think that we should have a ritual, because we're myth solvers, and we're cracking the case. I think we should celebrate what's this for? and crack this egg over our heads in celebration of the cracked cholesterol myth. Are you serious? I am so serious. <laughs> what do you think? Did we solve the case of the cholesterol fiend? <laughs> oh, by the way, um, the sulfur-based amino acids in eggs are great for your hair. I thought so. I <laughs> thought so. so. Hey, thanks, everybody, for Health Buzz. And, um, come to our website. It's healthbuzzshow.com. We also have a Facebook page. Please like us on Facebook. And give us your ideas and thoughts. What are you interested about learning? What do you have to offer? If you're a practitioner, we would love to have you on the show, inviting all good things, and be well. Thank you. And uh, next week on our, on our next show, we're going to have two health professionals who are going to cover essential oils. Uh, essential oils are remarkable in that they're the soul, heart, and the life force of aromatic plants, and they have a remarkable effect on our senses, brain chemistry, and different health applications. So we're going to actually do demonstrations with essential oils and show you what they're all about and how they can enhance your health. Okay, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.